This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. I know there's a fantastic story in there. You can just tell by looking. You actually can't uh, necessarily believe what you see. The forensic process is very much crossing things off a list. It does really scream out, you know, violence. Mummies, the preserved remains of people who lived long ago. Everyone knows that the Egyptians embalmed their dead, but for thousands of years, South American bodies were also mummified. Today, these mummies give us a unique insight into the mysterious world they inhabited, the way it was before the Europeans arrived. With newly developed scientific techniques, we can now unlock the world they once lived in, find out who they were, and often how they died. Burnley's Townley Hall Museum in Northwest England. Mummy investigator Dr. Joanne Fletcher is an Egyptologist, but her expertise covers mummies from around the globe. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Please come inside. Excellent. Thank you. She's about to discover her latest challenge. It came to us in 1913 and it was sent from Peru. I must say, I'm, I'm very much drawn immediately to the sort of shape of this extraordinary skull. It's, it's really, really elongated. The one thing that did interest us was this hole in the skull. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, look. It's not just circular, it's, it's quite square, actually. This hole is, is quite extraordinary, very, very graphic. It sort of, it, it, it does really scream out, you know, violence. It's, it's, it's quite awful. Is this maybe a cause of death? If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. We have tons of exclusive documentaries about the most important people in history that you will not find anywhere else. Our extensive catalogue of documentaries covers everything from the rise of Hannibal Barker to the illustrious treasures of King Tut. So sign up today for broadcast quality documentaries uncovering the mysteries of the ancient world. And it's not just documentaries either. We have a network of incredible history podcasts bringing you new episodes every day. Sign up now for a free trial. And Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. The body was donated to the museum by W.T. Taylor, a Burnley engineer who'd been working on hydroelectric projects in South America. Have we any idea whereabouts in Peru Taylor obtained it? Well, we think it was North Peru, North Peru, but we're not absolutely sure. In his notes, Taylor describes the mummy as Chachapoya, a culture known as the Cloud People because they lived high up in the Cloud Forest, a remote part of the highlands of northern Peru. They were a warrior race, famed for burying their dead on perilous rock ledges high up on cliff faces. What exactly are our parameters for this investigation? Well, we're quite happy for the mummy to go back to York. It's very rare to have such unrestricted access to a mummy of this kind. I am very, very certain we'll be able to give you some good results on this because, as you say, this was once a, an individual, a human being, and we owe it to them to find out all we can about its life and, presumably, its, its death. York University's mummy investigation team is a multidisciplinary group who've been pioneering new research into mummies for almost 10 years. Duncan Lees is the team's forensic archaeologist. He has the technology to make exact three-dimensional models of the mummies they study. All I'm doing is creating millions, tens of millions, of accurately surveyed points. 
Jill Scott is an Egyptologist who also specializes in the study of ancient bodies. She's the main archive researcher on the project. You don't only have that out of war wounds, you know, trauma to the skull, you also have it through ritual means as well. Stephen Buckley is an archaeological chemist. He has an international reputation for unlocking secrets hidden in ancient mummification techniques. It's very much going into the unknown. At this early stage of the investigation, the team already have an advantage. They can work on the actual mummy here at their base, and they've nicknamed him Cloud Man. I am so excited about this mummy, and I'm sure you'll all agree it's a fantastic example of mummification. It's, it's wonderful. Mummies like Cloud Man can be preserved either by natural or artificial means. The accepted wisdom is that the vast majority of Peruvian mummies were naturally preserved, either by being dried in cool air or in hot, dry sand. Our team now has the tools to determine whether this body was also embalmed. You're drawn, aren't you, immediately to an obvious, <laughs> yes. an obviously <laughs> unusual feature. I've never seen a skull like that. That is just such an extraordinary shape. Mm. They think it's Chachapoya. I know nothing about the Chachapoya people. I mean, you're talking about mountain regions. So this is why he's called the Cloud Man. I mean, what do we know about them? They are an incredible culture, really, because they were famed throughout ancient Peru for their warlike abilities. They were a pugilistic race. So, as a Chachapoya, Cloud Man would have been one of a race of warriors who lived between 800 and 1470 AD. They were brutally suppressed by the Incas, who stopped at nothing to expand their territory. But even in the midst of battle, the Incas were said to admire the strength and stature of the Chachapoya. We know that they were f famous for being very tall. Tall? They, they, that doesn't seem to fit with this, because even though he's very tightly bound and, and in this fetal position, the length of the individual limbs is not that great. Are we looking at a young adult here? Right, OK. So it could be a younger member of society. So it's something to explore. Stephen wants to get to the bottom of why Cloud Man's skin is so pale. For me, I mean, I'd be interested to know whether there's actually anything on the skin, uh, whether we've uh, really naturally preserved or whether there's something that's been applied that might be affecting the, uh, the appearance. There is an extraordinary amount of cord and binding on the, on the mummy. These robes are something else. I mean, far too many to have been simply used to fasten the, the hands to the head and bind the legs up. Cloud Man's hole in the head will also be a key area for investigation. Is it the fatal wound? I really would like to get to the bottom of what that hole suggests in terms of this individual's life and his death. Joanne has another resource for the team to work with. This is um, a fur-bound journal from W.T. Taylor, oh. who's, who was the person that actually brought them, the mummy back in the first place. Letters, photographs, his notes and maps. I'd very much like you I was going to say, I'd be really interested records. to have a look through this. <laughs> Besides having the book to work on, the team will also have to decipher the clues that remain on Cloud Man as they try to find out exactly who he was and how he died. This could be the most exciting case the team have ever taken on. Forensic archaeologist Duncan Lees has begun work building a virtual model of the mummy. He wants to stretch Cloud Man out of his fetal position using laser scans to give the team their first look at the whole body. All I'm doing is creating millions, tens of millions, of accurately surveyed points, accurately measured points across the surface. And the software allows you to look at that. The laser sends out a beam onto the mummy, and by constantly measuring the way it bounces back, it's able to produce an incredibly accurate three-dimensional model. On this mummy, you've got this sort of pale white matte finish, and so every single nuance, every single um, ripple within the tissue, all of the cords, all of the damage in this extraordinary shaped skull will show up really clearly, the absolutely beautiful data set. The beam and receptor are so precise, the model they generate is accurate to within 20 microns. That's 20 millionths of a meter, less than the thickness of an eyelash.
Once the 3D scan is complete, Duncan should be able to stretch the mummy out to see how tall he was and what sort of build he had in life. Historical researcher Jill Scott has been reading the journal that Burnley engineer W.T. Taylor brought back, along with Cloudman, from his travels in Peru. This should be able to paint a picture of where Cloudman came from and who he was. There's loads of interesting stuff in here, but it's only sort of when you get towards the end that I'm finding any particular references that are useful to us for the investigation for this mummy. Taylor left Burnley in 1910 and spent three years in Peru. Over that time, he kept this journal, which reveals a keen interest in mummies and Inca weaponry. And then it actually talks about him finding this mummy as well and sort of what he had to do to get there. Um, on the early morning, I, with two others, made preparations for entering the deep pit. <laughs> On several parts of the passage, we encountered several petrified mummies, human skulls and human bones. As much as, as this guy details everything here, we don't really get any sort of concept of provenance because all it mentioned was the fact that they've entered into mountains, down into a ravine, and that there's a hole which is about 40 feet deep. So that, that could be anywhere. We can't go to a map and pinpoint specifically and say that that is where that mummy was found. Given the lack of a precise location, Jill is going to need a Peruvian expert to help establish Cloudman's place of origin. The investigation has already produced its first results. Duncan has animated the data from his laser scan. Well, I've been working on the, the laser scan data. I've put it into this visualisation package. Yeah. It means that we can take this sort of virtual tour of the mummy very quickly. He's articulated the limbs of what he's pretty certain now is an adult, then taken account of any shrinkage over the centuries. Then you want to see something cool? I have, I have, we have done some work on it. So what we've done is taken the mummy and, take, as I said, broken it down into uh, the component pieces of, a, of an articulated uh, adult human. So the arms, the legs, the head and everything else. And what we've done is, is run this animation which shows the mummy moving from its fetal position into, <laughs> into its standing position. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous! And, uh, and looking at you at the end. We've got a definite height here. Mm -hmm. We've got a 142, 1.42 metres. So just, just under five foot in height. Five foot? Yeah, well, yeah, not very big. You told me these are people famed for their pale skin, but also their height. Their so. stature. They were noted for their height, for their stature. Five foot? Yeah, just un well, under five foot, actually. One so meter forty-two. literally, what? Yeah, if I would brought a tape measure, I could show you, but, but certainly only up to your sort of shoulder. Oh. The Chachapoya were known for being tall, so the revelation that Cloudman was only 142 centimetres cast doubt on Taylor's claim that he was Chachapoya. With his ethnic origin in question, the team looked to chemistry to find some concrete answers. Archaeological chemist Stephen Buckley specialises in the chemical analysis of mummies. Using pioneering techniques, he works with minute samples of the mummy to establish where it's from, how old it is, and how it came to be preserved. The method he uses is GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. This complex testing process can identify minute quantities of chemical compounds that have come into contact with the body. Stephen is also taking samples which he'll send off for carbon-14 analysis to establish a date for Cloudman. Peruvian mummies can be anything up to 7,000 years old, so this will be another crucial clue to Cloudman's identity. Based on the mummy's pale skin, Stephen has a hunch that Cloudman was artificially preserved, and if he can find evidence for this, it'll be groundbreaking. Well, they're usually assumed to be nat naturally mummified. Mm. Um, and looking at this, there's nothing to give us any clues. Uh, but what interests me is, is just to see whether, whether the chemistry can actually provide any answers on that one. Artificial mummification was extremely rare in ancient Peru and would certainly point to a high-status individual. 
Joanne also wants Stephen to do paleo dietary analysis to learn more about Cloud Man from the food he ate, which, if he's from the mountains, should consist of high altitude crops, traces of which can be found in hair, bone, and body parts. Now, I have to say, I've looked very closely and I can't see any evidence of hair or, in fact, fingernails or toenails, which is quite unusual for a South American mummy. So, if we wanted to undertake paleo dietary analysis, for instance, how would we go about that? Well, I think that could be a problem, but I suppose another option is perhaps to look for the, um, see whether the stomach or the intestines have survived and actually analyse the contents there. Fortunately, the team has one of the world's leading paleopathologists on hand. Professor Don Brothwell combines his vast medical knowledge with a profound expertise in ancient remains. Stevens asked Don to cut into and sample what remains of Cloudman's internal organs to see if he can find out about diet and evidence of possible toxins in the body. But it's not an easy task. There is so much decomposition, we will have to sample um, fairly extensively. I am pleased that we have permission to do that. To find out where best to operate, Don conducts his initial examination with an endoscope, normally used for exploratory medical work. Well, I've heard of rump steaks, but rump endoscopy is new to me. Um... Don is looking for the remains of the intestinal tract, which will give the best information about diet, possible toxins in the system, or infection. Uh, there's some structures that are more complete, but it's extremely damaged and ragged inside. Don will cut into what he's found of the mummy's soft tissue to obtain samples for Stephen to analyze. The trick is to distinguish between what is useful for the investigation and what is totally decayed matter. It's just like old shoe leather in parts. That could be a part of the intestinal wall. What we need is a sort of mini hoover to bring it out. Yes, true. They are also hoping to extract useful materials from Cloud Man's head. You, uh, you're going for brain? Well, I'm going for the, what's left in terms of tissue, which may be brain. It, well, there's fly pupae there, I think, as well. As the team wait for the samples to be processed, they concentrate on establishing Cloud Man's cultural context. Because ancient Peru is outside the team's direct area of expertise, Jill Scott is meeting Dr. Nicholas Saunders, an anthropologist specializing in pre-Columbian Peru, here at the Bankfield Museum, Halifax. Take a look at this. Now, the striking thing that we've all noticed in our discussion is the cranial disfiguration. So, what can you tell us about that? Yes, it looks weird to us, but in fact it was absolutely normal in ancient South America. Uh, many um, civilizations def um, deformed the, the cranial um, bones <clears throat> from birth. So we know that sometimes this was done for ethnic identity, right. tribal identity, uh, and sometimes it was done as a sign of uh, beauty, and it was also done uh, in terms of a sign of social status. The unnaturally long and pointed shape of Cloud Man's head is clearly a result of cranial modification, examples of which have been found on skulls all over the world. How did they do it? But basically, they bound it with cloth uh, and sometimes with wooden boards, back and front or on the side, depending on the exact shape they wanted. Right. But for them, it was an aesthetic ideal. Yeah. It was a thing of beauty. For a two-year period, starting shortly after birth, Cloud Man would have had his head tightly bound whilst his skull was still malleable to shape it into this extraordinary form. The effort this procedure would have taken suggests Cloud Man was definitely an elite member of his society. Working with the photographs, Nick has found other interesting clues to Cloud Man's identity. We know from ancient Peru that prisoners of war 
uh, and maybe shamans who cast inappropriate spells uh, were often tied by the rope, tied by the body, uh, roping one person to another, and sometimes then were sacrificed. So there's a, an intriguing possibility that we can't prove at the moment that this individual might have been uh, a prisoner of war. Perhaps Cloud Man, bound with so much rope, died in captivity. To explore this possibility and to pinpoint more about Cloud Man's identity, Jill's hoping Nick will unlock the secrets in Taylor's diary. His first analysis reveals some disturbing discrepancies. The conditions that he found these mummies in uh, really relates to the coast. Um, rather than up in the mountains and, and the cloud forest where, he, uh, where they may have come from, but I don't think they did. Uh, examples, for instance, would be he talks about going 40 feet down on a rope uh, into a pit to find these mummies. If he was in Chachapoyas uh, region, he'd have to be scaling a cliff for 100 feet in order to reach them. The Chachapoya theory looks even more in doubt. He talks that they're about they're surrounded by sand and soil, which is clearly not going to be the case in Chachapoyas. And he also makes a, a reference similarly to the mud bricks that surround some of these mummies. Uh, again, you find that all the time on the south coast where mud bricks are preserved. Uh, in the Chachapoyas, a constant rainy area that it is, they wouldn't last five minutes. Nick also points out that ancient Chachapoya territory was at least 200 miles away from Lima, where Taylor was based. I think it's much more likely, in fact, that he probably went for uh, a day or two days around the Lima area, maybe into the foothills of the Andes, um, and with a guide found and located these things uh, and, and took them back. So not quite as heroic, I think, and so therefore definitely not Chachapoya. This confirms the team's suspicions, first sparked when Duncan's scan revealed the mummy's short stature. From the description in Taylor's journal, it looks like his expeditions never even got close to Chachapoya territory. I think what we're probably looking at is uh, a small coastal um, culture, society, maybe around about 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 AD. Um, and it's the same kind of style of mummification that these people do along the coast. This is the investigation's first major breakthrough. The evidence suggests that Cloud Man is not Chachapoya, as they originally believed. He's probably from the coast, not the mountains, a totally different culture. This isn't the only development in the investigation. Stevens just had a major setback. None of the samples Don took have provided any dietary information. This means the team's drawn a complete blank on diet, which could have pinned down a location for Cloud Man. But he does have other important new findings. The carbon-14 results are in, and a date has emerged for Cloud Man. 1100 AD, right when anthropologist Nick Saunders suspected. This date places Cloud Man firmly at a time when no single culture predominated in Peru. Instead, small warring tribes fought each other for territory in a power vacuum. And given Cloud Man lived at such a violent time, the team need to test Nick's suggestion that the excessive rope bindings around Cloud Man indicates that he was a prisoner of war who died in captivity. Duncan's been working with his laser images to separate out the rope from the rest of the body. I know this looks a bit suspect, mm. and, uh, but there is method to the madness, I'm sure. Yeah. The, the thing is that we've got some very good measurement data from the laser scanning now and, and looking at the photography. We've got a dimension for that rope length. We've got just over two and a half metres of rope that we can measure. And there are areas that are occluded, areas that we can't see. That must add about another sort of half a meter maybe a bit more than that onto the length okay. and and it's all very well to look at that virtually i think we need to get an idea of what that sort of length of rope looks like really and how how these bindings might work i'd hoped that you'd help me with the binding side of things and we, and we could see what was going on if these three meters of rope are enough for duncan to tie up jill this could support the theory that cloud man was a prisoner So we've got mm -hmm. the knees and the hands were, were wrapped. Okay, okay. 
You see, you've already got hardly any rope left. No, I mean, to me, this seems to be the, the, the sort of binding that would have kept the body in position in death. You know, literally to keep it in like, that fetal not, position. Yeah, not for anything else to me. Although three metres of rope did initially seem like the substantial amount needed to bind a prisoner, Duncan's experiment has ruled out Nick Saunders' theory that Cloud Man was a bound captive. The team decide to refocus the investigation and find out what secrets the body itself might be hiding. They take Cloud Man to be x-rayed. The X-ray highlights Cloud Man's cranial modification beautifully, but can it reveal any evidence of age, injury, or battle scars? Armed with the images, Joanne meets up with paleopathologist Don Brothwell to see what information he can derive from them. And that one, of course, you've got the teeth aren't particularly worn. Third movers are there. I think it's probably a very young adult, but an adult rather than a teenager. Joanne wants to determine exactly what caused the hole in Cloud Man's head. I don't know. My initial thoughts, is it a war wound? So I was wondering if, if the sort of the nature of the hole might back that up. One's immediate thought is it's ancient surgery. But the other possibility, of course, is, I mean, looking at it, you've got to think of other things. Uh, infection can produce holes in the head. Um, Tumours can produce holes in the head. Joanne is not convinced and wants to know more about battle injuries. Would the sort of impact of maybe a slingshot, high velocity slingshots on a skull such as this have resulted in, in the shape we can see here, do you think? I doubt it, but you should certainly consider that as well. The thing is, if you, if I hit you on the head with a hammer, then what you get is a, a sort of compressed fracture. Your skull collapses around the area where the hammer's impacting on your head. But you still get the bone there. And the only way you would get a hole is, if, in fact, if your ancient surgeon then trims away the compressed bone. So would that be a possibility, though? Could we have somebody that was brought from the battlefield yeah. and then these surgeons that we know were very sophisticated then perform some sort of surgery on this individual. A common form of cranial surgery in ancient Peru was trepanation, the surgical removal of a portion of the skull to relieve pressure from a wound or chronic pain. It would be interesting to try and find out the various ways these surgeries could be performed. How can we go about trying to replicate how this was done? Because we really need to get to the bottom of what caused it. What do you think would be the best way to do it? Experimental work, don't you think? So far, the team knows that Cloud Man was a high-status young male from coastal Peru who died young in his early 20s. Now, to pin down the cause of death, they'll need to undertake two practical experiments. To test Don's preferred theory, they'll reproduce ancient head surgery. To put Joanne's theory to the test, they'll need to simulate a battle injury. Ancient Peru was a violent place, full of warring cultures fighting terrible battles. They attacked each other with axes, maces and slingshots, all common weapons. Peruvian expert Nick Saunders has a theory about which weapon might have caused Cloud Man's injury, based on the size and the shape of the hole. This is a, a slingshot. These things were used uh, as slingshots, but they were also worn around the head. It should be worn into war and then taken off and used, uh, and then used, in fact, perhaps to um, cause a dreadful damage uh, and wound in somebody else's head right. um, as well, uh, which may be what we have uh, in the mummy. With a possible weapon established, the team's in a position to try to recreate the mummy's injury. The results might reveal what caused the mysterious hole in Cloud Man's head. Lead investigator Joanne Fletcher is at Flamborough Beach, North Yorkshire. She won't be satisfied until she's either confirmed or eliminated the possibility that the hole in the head is a war wound. Tom Richardson works at the Leeds Armoury and is an expert in ancient weapons technology. 
Joanne set him the challenge of recreating the mummy's injury. I, I sling at about 30 metres a second. Well, that's not bad. <laughs> that's quite quick. <laughs> yeah. That's quicker than fast bowlers in cricket bowl at. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, they bounce the ball on the, on the pitch before it hits the batsman. So we're actually looking at something that, that could do a lot of damage. I mean, something going that quick. I mean, it's sort of... Uh, well, yeah, like an ancient version of a bullet from a gun, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it's very difficult to sling in a non-lethal way. To test the lethal power of a slingshot, they've brought along a pig's head to be the target. Joanne also has a speed gun to determine just how fast Tom can sling at. They take their positions. If Tom can hit the pig's head with sufficient power, he could prove that a slingshot might have caused the mummy's injury. Oh, 65. Tom's getting readings of 65 miles an hour or 30 meters a second, but he's still way off target. Of course, the problem with all this is accuracy. Well, how would they have actually deployed these in ancient times? Rather than having a single slinger sniping away, you have to think of a whole group of, say, 500 slingers raining stones down on a whole group of people. So kind of like aerial bombardment, it, isn't it? Exactly so. Finally, he's starting to home in on the pig's head. Got it. Although the slingshot hit the head at 65 miles an hour, it didn't even pierce the skin. Right now, Joanne's battle injury theory is not looking very convincing. Meanwhile, forensic archaeologist Duncan Lees wants to explore how ancient surgery might have created the injury by trepanning a pig skull. Royal Navy Surgeon Commander Mike Edwards is particularly well qualified to conduct this procedure. The last time I did anything closely approaching this was in a tent just outside Basra in 2003. I was uh, called to um, operate on a Royal Marine who'd been hit by some shrapnel. Right. Back in ancient Peru, people were also being trepanned for battle injuries. One of the, the main reasons for doing it may well have been trauma. Right. It would usually be blunt trauma from clubs and slingshots. And um, the rate of skull fracture would be high. So in essence, it's a sort of battlefield, battlefield, battlefield medicine. medicine. Okay. But there would be also non-traumatic reasons for doing okay. it, it's, say, for relief of epilepsy. Okay. Uh, if they had a brain tumour that was growing and they had increasing headaches, uh, feeling might have been to let the evil spirits out. People have been trepanned in countless cultures across the world since at least 7,000 BC. I think there are even uh, modern uh, extrapolations of this with uh, lunatics that think they can reach heaven by uh, opening their skull to the atmosphere. It's quite likely that many of those trepanned in ancient Peru were also seeking spiritual awakening rather than relief from a head injury. For this experiment, Mike will be using a replica of an ancient surgical instrument, one that might have been used in 12th century Peru. Talk me through the tools that you brought them, Mike. Now, this is, this is uh, an obsidian blade. OK, so that's volcanic glass. Volcanic then. glass. And it seems incredibly sharp down the, the edge here. Oh, it is incredibly sharp. And I would say this would equate to something like a scalpel, which we have here. Right, OK. So we can see that, you know, in fact, you know, this may even be sharper than the scalpel. Yeah. If Cloudman's injury was caused by trepanation, this kind of obsidian blade is probably what they would have used to cut into his head. Mike wants to use this tool to see if he can recreate the same kind of hole in a pig's head. Okay. I'm just going to hope that this is sharp enough. Okay. Oh, mm. fantastic. Once we're through the first layer of skin, it does go through a lot easier. So it needs a bit of pressure. If I'd made this cut... So if this was alive? This would be bleeding like anything. OK. I think it would be possible to lose about four pints of blood from a, uh, a severe scalp laceration. It's absolutely amazing. In ancient Peru, there's evidence that red-hot metal would have been used to sear the blood vessels and stem the bleeding. I'm just going to make a cut here now.
If he didn't pass out from the pain, Cloudman would have been conscious throughout the operation. I've scored in a circular way around here, you can see, and I've just gone through the outer table of the skull. I'm feeling I'm just getting to the inside, and my plan is to keep doing this until I get through the skull. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to go so deep that I go into the brain. This is just great. What a great tool. I don't think I could get such a good result even with a modern chisel or a, or a scalpel. After 45 minutes, Mike's close to penetrating the pig's skull. This is going to come very soon. I can see movement on the trepan piece there. I think there is most definitely movement there. And if I just lift that away, oh, that is fantastic. So look, we've, so we've got the trepan fantastic. piece and then, and then the hole in the brain underneath, but with no damage. No, it we looks to me like it's all intact. Using a Stone Age tool, Mike has managed to trepan a skull without even damaging the membrane surrounding the brain. The team has now explored what might have caused Cloud Man's head injury in two ways. Before the results can be evaluated, the two damaged pig skulls need to be x-rayed. While Joanne and Duncan have been experimenting with pig's heads, Stephen's been working through the thousands of pages of chemical data generated by the samples he's taken from the mummy. To conclude the experiments, Joanne returns to Don Brothwell to see if the X-ray evidence supports her theory that the hole was originally a war wound. The surgery here, mm -hmm. and then down here we've got the results of the uh, slingshot. I think your slingshot experiments, you might have damaged the skull just very superficially. Well, I think uh, your experimental work here with trepanation is beautiful. and. Um, convinces me actually that what you have here is trepanation without any doubt. Don's conclusive, trepanation caused the hole in Cloudman's head. So was my day on the beach completely wasted? No, a day on the beach was <laughs> lovely. I hope the weather is fine and you paddle, but as far as this is concerned, forget it. It's Do you think this was successful surgery? Oh, it, certainly, because on the x-ray, you can see that there's a lot of healing around the hole. So we can say this wasn't immediately fatal. Oh, no, no, no. And Not it wasn't all. the cause of death. No. So this individual lived. How long would you say? Well, it's so well healed up that you can't really sort of predict how long, but he lived many months. Cloudman survived his surgery, but given he died at such a young age, could having such major surgery have left him open to infection? Far from confirming cause of death, the team's experiments have only raised more questions. There are no clues as to why Cloudman was trepanned. Was it because he suffered from severe head pains or epilepsy? Or did he, as people have done throughout the centuries, open his head up voluntarily to be closer to his gods? Joanne has called a team meeting. If there's no cause of death, it's, it's a question of where do we go from here, really? I mean, I don't really share the pessimism. Because, I mean, the forensic process is very much crossing things off a list, you know. There are, there are very few things that you can say for sure. There's a lot of things that you can cross off, and we've, the work that we've done so far is crossing things off that list. I know there's a fantastic story in there. You can just tell by looking at him. He's, he's a, a fantastic mummy, and I so want to do this justice. So I think maybe I am sort of... Uh, being a, a little despairing too early on. Yeah, yeah. pessimistic, yeah, yeah. The science, there's so much more science still to do. So much that we haven't looked at, glaringly obvious things yeah. in front of us. I mean, th there, are, there must be answers already coming out of the science that you're doing, Steve, as well. What, what sort of stage are we at with yours? The mummy has been uh, smoked. Really? So oh. that was part of the mummification process? Yeah. This is a major revelation. Stephen's hunch was spot on. He's found out that the mummy's pale skin color was produced artificially. The body was smoked as a method of preservation. 
there's nicotine there with tobacco leaves, nicotine. it would appear. Yeah. Oh, that, that's pretty yeah, uh, that's shattering, that's actually. So, oh. mummy, mummified, certainly. A surprise, a surprise perhaps, but uh, an un unfair a pessimism as well, I think. You know. Yeah. I know. The scientists will come up with the right stuff. Yeah, don't you worry. That is but fantastic also, news. This is really big, isn't it? I mean, that, that's sort of the first time I know of, of this definitely being found on a mummy. Yeah, it's quite nice. Well, that's the understatement yeah. of the year, isn't it? <laughs> Artificial mummification in Peru is virtually undocumented. This has to suggest that Cloud Man was a member of the elite. Smoking the body would have helped to preserve it by keeping out insects. But obtaining the tobacco for this procedure would have been a massive task. It must have been one of the rarest and most precious commodities, since the nearest tobacco was grown in the Amazon basin at least 400 miles away. It would have required weeks of travelling to bring it back to Cloud Man's coastal region. As the results come in, Stephen realises that he's on the verge of a major scientific discovery. He's found chemical substances which show that not only was Cloud Man smoked, he was also embalmed. On the head you have a plant wax, which is actually very characteristic and it uh, comes from candela wax from Mexico. But in contrast, on the legs, you've got an insect wax, which is unusual. Cloudman's legs were treated with insect wax, his body with a balsam tree resin, and his head with a plant wax, first and foremost as preservatives to prevent water and fungi from entering and destroying the body. But what makes Stephen's results so intriguing is that these substances weren't readily available in coastal Peru. The candelilla wax found on the head was derived from a small shrub which is still used today in beauty products. It was sourced an amazing 2,000 miles away on another continent, Mexico in North America. Using these highly prized products on his body means Cloud Man must have been an extremely important person. Such lavish attention suggests the equivalent of a state funeral. If I was asked to speculate on who this individual might be, from science certainly, this is a high status individual. He's been treated with substances from coming from really long distances. So uh, this would have been a, a very expensive process. So this is someone who had a great deal of wealth um, and status uh, and was someone quite special. To understand what these substances symbolized in ancient Peruvian burial rituals, Stephen needs to consult a specialist. He sends his lab results to the team's Peruvian expert, Nick Saunders. Stephen's scientific discoveries are startling, but won't fully unlock the secret of Cloud Man's role in life unless they're put into their proper cultural context. Stephen's faith has paid off. Anthropologist Nick Saunders has examined the chemical findings and emailed some astounding conclusions. There's plenty to look at. Uh, one thing I notice is the, um, the recipe you describe is really a microcosm of the herbal world, each element representing a physical and symbolically important substance. That's pretty good. Yes, look, it shows us that these ancient peoples had a philosophy of the body where different substances and varying combinations were regarded as symbolically appropriate for the head and legs. That's exactly right, isn't it? That's, that's exactly what the science is telling us. Yeah. The embalming process clearly had huge symbolic significance. Each part of Cloud Man was deliberately treated with a different substance. His head with plant wax, his body with tree resin, and his legs with insect wax. The presence of insect wax on our mummy might indicate he could have been a shaman or a sorcerer who used these creatures for curing illness in life and was now in turn protected in death by their spiritual essence. Brilliant. Yeah. This is great. This is the hard science coming together with cultural history. Yeah, I mean, it's great to see the, uh, the science making sense. This is a huge breakthrough. The evidence suggests that Cloud Man was a shaman, a tribal witch doctor who cast spells and communicated with the spirit world. Insects had a divine quality in ancient Peru as bringers of disease. They were also used in preventative medicine. 
It's possible a shaman would have consumed certain insects with psychedelic properties as part of his ritual communication with the gods. And there's more. The nicotine in the body and mass may have been partly from the use of it during life, so if he was a shaman mm -hmm. using this stuff, but also from the mummy's post-mortem ritual treatment deemed appropriate for a shaman. There are even tobacco shamans in Venezuela today. A tobacco shaman, what a, an amazing concept. That's well, fantastic. It's, it's excellent. I mean, I was, I was sure of the, uh, of the science of the chemistry, but it's actually nice to see that this actually does make some sense. Stephen's discoveries, both on tobacco smoking and Cloud Man's chemical embalming, will reshape scientific opinion on South American mummies. After weeks of investigation, the team have finally established who Cloud Man was in life. A shaman, a high status and powerful religious figure. This was a man born around 1100 AD in the coastal region of Peru, close to where the capital city of Lima stands today. At birth, his head was bound into this extraordinary shape, like the other elite members of his society. And sometimes it was done as a sign of uh, beauty, and it was also done uh, in terms of a sign of social status. But Cloud Man had a greater destiny than his contemporaries. He only lived to his early 20s. I think it's probably a very young adult, but an adult rather than a teenager. But in his short life, it seems he rose to be a shaman, a holy man with a direct link to the spirit world. And perhaps he was trepanned to open up his head to commune with his gods. The feeling might have been to let the evil spirits out. We'll never be sure how he died, but given the lack of other trauma on his body, it's likely he died from an illness or infection, possibly as a long-term side effect of his trepanning. At death, his high status was reflected in the extraordinary care with which his body was preserved, with waxes brought from thousands of miles away. This would have been a very expensive process. So this is someone who had a great deal of wealth. So we've gone from the cloud man to tobacco shaman. Thanks to the embalming skills of his community, he has not decayed like almost all his contemporaries. This expert and rare preservation has allowed the team to breathe life back into this individual and unravel the secrets sealed in his mummified body for almost a thousand years.